All right. Well, it is 12.03, so in our classic UH fashion, we will be getting started. So again, thank you everyone for being here for this week's very special Grand Round. We have Dr. Nass logged in uh, with us, and this lecture is named after him. So this is our 2021 NAF lecture. And we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Helen Boucher here to uh, University Hospitals um, to speak about antimicrobial resistance. So I just want to get started by giving a little bit of background on Dr. Boucher. And I want to mention what Dr. Bonoma said. Her accomplishments extend far beyond what I'm about to say. Um, so we are very lucky to have you here today. Dr. Helen Boucher. Uh, is the Chief of the Division of Geographic Medicine and Infectious Diseases at Tufts Medical Center. She is Professor of Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine and the Director of the Tufts Center for Integrated Management of Antimicrobial Resistance. Dr. Boucher graduated with an undergraduate degree in English from College of the Holy Cross before earning her medical degree from the University of Texas Medical School at Houston. She completed her internship, residency, chief residency, and clinical and research ID fellowships at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Dr. Boucher has worked as a physician in the field of infectious diseases since the mid-1990s at the Tufts Medical Center in downtown Boston. She is, continues to work there as an esteemed educator at the Tufts University School of Medicine. In addition to her current leadership roles, she served as the director of the Infectious Diseases Fellowship Program at the institution and was elected to the American Board of Internal Medicine Infectious Diseases Subspecialty Board. As a scholar, she focuses on antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections, antibiotic development, and treatment of staph aureus infections. She has an additional focus of expertise in infections associated with heart transplantation and left ventricular assist devices. In her role as a clinician, researcher, academic, and public opinion leader, Dr. Boucher is an international figure in the field of antimicrobial resistance. She is as likely to publish research articles describing the utility of new antimicrobial or insightful editorial pieces in the New England Journal of Medicine as she is to be featured in the pages of the Washington Post or the New York Times commenting on the societal impact of antimicrobial resistance. Dr. Boucher is a member of the Presidential Advisory Council on Combating Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria, providing recommendations at the highest level of government. She serves as editor of the premier journal in antibiotic resistance, antimicrobial agents, and chemotherapy, and is a member of the editorial advisory board of the journal Clinical Infectious Diseases. Dr. Boucher also serves prominently in professional societies and currently serves in the Board of Directors and as Treasurer of the Infectious Diseases Society of America. In 2015, she was recognized with a prestigious IDSA Citation Award for exemplary contri contribution to IDSA in her work on antimicrobial resistance. Please help me welcome Dr. Helen Boucher. Thank you so much, Chiara. It's a real honor to be with all of you today, and especially Dr. Naff. I had the real honor to visit with Dr. Naff earlier this morning, and I'm just so honored uh, to be able to participate in this couple of days celebrating your incredible career, and thank you for your generous, generous welcome. So my disclosures are shown here, and I don't think any are particularly relevant. We're not going to be focusing on particular products uh, in this conversation. So the title of the talk was uh, Antibiotic Resistance, the Silent Pandemic. And I hope I convince you that this pandemic actually may already be upon us and um, we'll come back to it. But this is, a, this is a figure from The Guardian in the UK where they are actually ahead of us in a lot of things, antibiotic resistance, but kind of showing the wave over uh, the small pill that's left. And then I think this comment from Dame Sally Davies in the UK really sums it up. The water is hot. COVID is a lobster drop, uh, dropped into boiling water, making lots of noise as it expires, whereas AMR, antimicrobial resistance, is a lobster put into cold water, heating up slowly, not making any noise. And Dame Sally, for those of you who don't know her, is uh, probably the world's leading advocate on the problem of antibiotic resistance. And she has used her various roles to bring the problem of antibiotic resistance to the world. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And 
we still have much work to do in this area. So because I'm a clinician and I'm talking to a clinical audience, and this is a clinical problem, we're gonna start with a couple of cases uh, today. So the first is a case of a healthy young lady who has a history of injecting drugs. And she's had two prior episodes of endocarditis related to opioid use. The first required a tricuspid valve repair. The second episode was caused by methicillin susceptible, uh, resistant staph aureus that involved that repaired tricuspid valve, so an abnormal valve. That treatment was complicated as is all too often the case with renal failure related to vancomycin, a prolonged hospitalization, external wound infection, again, problems that we see not infrequently here, and I'm sure you do too in Cleveland. And she came back uh, to us with a worsening of this sternal wound infection caused by MRSA. And the kicker was that she was 22 weeks pregnant, had a very complicated course, multiple surgeries, long course of antibiotics, multiple trips to the ICU. The good news was she delivered a healthy term baby in our ICU, which was a first. Um, but the bad news is she continues to have problems and she may yet have to have more valve surgery. And so you know, this raises the point that a common drug resistant infection that we've known about for all too long, uh, MRSA, is still very much among us. And this problem of opioid use in persons who inject drugs, we know that persons who inject drugs are 16 times more likely to develop MRSA. So common problem, lots of morbidity and sadly mortality. So contrast this to another patient. This is a 60 year old lady with leukemia who was in our hospital after a successful round of induction chemotherapy. She was in remission waiting for her counts to recover when she developed fever and a cough and chest x-ray showed pneumonia. She was still pancytopenic and she was up on our, on our hemonc floor waiting uh, for those counts to recover. And the hematologist felt very good about her overall prognosis. She was on uh, kind of our usual protocol of meropenem and vancomycin as empirical therapy. Well, the blood cultures grew this bug. Elizabeth Kingia meningoseptica, which is not a common one in the microbiology lab uh, kind of pop-up said infectious disease consultation recommended because this is a multi-drug resistant organism. And you can see down below all the R's by all the antibiotics that we're used to using and some that were newer at the time. Uh, on the lower right, you see septazidine avibactam and septolazine tazobactam. So I had the sad duty of going to meet this lady and telling her this news. And she was sort of sitting in a chair and looked at me and said, well, how can this be? You know, you're gonna find something to fix this, right? And we, we did a lot. We added um, a couple of drugs as shown here, septazidine, mavibactam, and estrianam. We sent the organism off to Dr. Bonomo, your beloved and my beloved Dr. Bonomo, uh, to his lab for further testing. We obtained compassionate use of a new drug that has since been approved, cefiterocol. We got it within four days, which is pretty good uh, by the way these things go. And we did a lot of maneuvers to try to kind of rescue her from this awful infection. And sadly, uh, it didn't work. She deteriorated, required uh, intubation and ended up succumbing to this infection 10 days later. So two kind of extremes of the spectrum of antibiotic resistant infections, but these cases and more kind of beg the question of whether we are returning to a pre-antibiotic era in this era of resistance. And I think, you know, one of the messages is, is that resistant infections can affect us, all of us, and threaten the modern medical care that we're used to and that we need to do something now if we're going to fix this. You know, we know all of us, and I'm sure all of you in internal medicine know that we have to use our antibiotics, especially often with limited data. We've gone back to using old drugs like colistin and phosphomycin, uh, taking them off the shelf to try to use them to combat uh, infections for which we have no other options. And so because of this, we've had to turn to a number of other kind of non-drug measures to manage this problem. And it's not that different from COVID, right? Where we have therapeutic drug measures and non-drug measures. So we'll talk about some of those things like stewardship and surveillance the tools that we need to combat this problem as we go through. So this problem has been in the news for decades. Um, and these are just some clips of different um, kind of lay press about antibiotic resistance. And, it's true there's been more attention in the UK and Europe than in the US, but we've had some in the US as well. And I think that um, some attention has certainly been paid to this problem. The CDC started to focus on this problem in 2013 with their global threat report, which is shown here. Um, Europe issued a similar one at the same time as did the WHO and some other entities around the world to kind of highlight the global nature of this problem. At the time in 2013, we had estimates 
of the impact of antibiotic resistance and the estimates at that time were over 2 million illnesses and over 23,000 deaths in our country. But we'll come back and talk about the limitations of the data that lead to these estimates and, and the sad reality that in even in 2021 in the United States, we do not have a clear number of how many people have resistant infections or how many people die with them in our country. So this group uh, in the UK led by Lord Jim O'Neill published the famous AMR review now uh, several years ago where they estimated the impact of AMR if we don't make any changes by the year 2050, over 10 million people will die from antibiotic resistant infections, which is more than cancer uh, and many other diseases combined as you see there on the right. Lord Jim O'Neill is an economist who used to work at Goldman Sachs, and you'd say, well, why, what does he care about this problem? Why did he get so involved? He saw it, as did many other leaders uh, in the G7 and the G20, as a sort of geopolitical problem, that the economic and other impacts, security impacts of this problem merit at global attention. And so this report, when it was published, was one of the first things that elevated this problem of resistance to a global stage. So I alluded to this before, but we all know, and you all know as well as I or better, that we need antibiotics to do almost everything we do in medical care today, right? We need to support our patients who get chemotherapy with antibiotics, transplantation patients, uh, little tiny babies in the NICU, simple surgeries like cesarean sections and joint replacement all require antibiotic support to get through them in all of the intensive care. So if we don't solve this problem of antibiotic resistance, it could put all of these even simple therapies at risk. The cost of resistance has been estimated. We looked at some numbers in terms of death estimates. They've been updated and we'll come back to this in a minute. The economic costs have been estimated by a number of people. Several years ago, the US costs were estimated over $20 billion a year. Lost productivity has been estimated in the billions per year. A more recent study from the VA um, was published just this year that looked at the cost of antibiotic resistant infections across the six most common resistant pathogens. And what this shows is that just six pathogens lead to national healthcare costs of over $4.6 billion in our country. And you can see on the top, uh, acinetobacter and in the bottom, pseudomonas kind of leading the way. And you might say, well, these infections aren't that common, but they're common enough and costly enough to lead to that kind of an impact. So very, very impressive in terms of dollars. And this is getting policymakers' attention. So that leads us to the question of how did AMR get this bad, right? We know bacteria become resistant in nature. There's nothing we're ever going to do to stop that. But one way we can help it to go faster is to overuse antibiotics. And I would propose that in our country, and in most of the developing world, it's overuse of antibiotics that has gotten us into a lot of the pickle that we're in now. So Lori Hicks at the CDC is probably our leader in looking at um, use and overuse of antibiotics in our country. And this is a look at one of her big observations that I think is a great takeaway for all of us. And that is that antibiotic prescribing varies geographically in our country for reasons that we completely don't understand. And so this is a heat map, and I think we're all used to looking at these in the era of COVID, but the dark red is bad and the light is good. And you can see that the highest rate of prescription is in West Virginia, 1,197 per thousand, compared to Alaska, where it's only 462. You know, this is um, limited by the kind of data it is. It's from a database, but this observation has been seen again and again. And the reasons for these differences really are not still well understood. We also know that antibiotics are prescribed differently in different settings, right? As, as house staff and residents and fellows, you're used to prescribing in a hospital or an outpatient clinic, but there are lots of other places where antibiotics are used and perhaps overused. And this study, again, from the CDC, shows the significant difference in antibiotic prescription here just for acute respiratory infections in different outpatient settings. And you can see at the left, urgent care centers, 46% of folks leave with a prescription for a respiratory infection for an antibiotic prescription for a respiratory infection that is likely viral uh, compared to uh, a doctor's office or a retail health center, orders of magnitude different. So these are areas uh, that require further investigation and likely intervention. COVID-19 has had its own impact on the problem of antibiotic resistance that we're still learning about, I would submit. I think we still don't know 
uh, the full nature of the connection here. We do know that antibiotics have been overused in the era of COVID, especially in our early, you know, the March 2020 surge. And these are some data from the lay press um, talking about how heavily overused antibiotics were. And, you know, I don't know about you all, but I know at our hospital, uh, we learned a lot in that first surge about appropriate stewardship of antibiotics and used a lot less uh, during our second surge. Then there are other places that a lot of us never think about. This is looking at dental prescriptions. It turns out that dentists prescribe a lot of antibiotics. And this is a study from the JAMA uh, group of journals showing uh, the high percentage of antibiotics uh, prescribed in dental practices and the fact that 81% uh, of it is likely unnecessary. So not aligned with the guidance for which patients should have antibiotic prophylaxis. So again, another area of breeding uh, for antibiotic resistance and a place for interventions. How about globally? This is a look uh, at data from the CDDEP, which is an excellent organization. And the link is shown here before uh, at the bottom if you're interested. Uh, this is one of the leading global groups looking at this problem. And they did a study looking at antibiotic prescribing rates in different countries around the world. And they've developed a beautiful sort of report card by country. And this is just a snapshot showing where we are in the United States in the orange bar, which is quite far to the right uh, in terms of prescribing. We're at about a 25% rate compared to countries in Europe, if you look at the left, like the Netherlands, who are much, much lower. We're not the worst, but we're quite a bit far from the best. Here's another look at the global uh, antibiotic use uh, situation. This is another kind of a heat map looking at doses per thousand people. And I add this to highlight the point that it's important as we think about the global problem to remember that in many, indeed most parts of the world, antibiotics are available without a prescription as shown with this person up in the, uh, in the photo here who obtained antibiotics over the counter. That raises a whole number of different issues in terms of how we figure out what's going on and intervene to change it. So what about animals? So the, the problem of antibiotic resistance really is a one health issue. It involves uh, the interplay between humans, animals, and the environment. And the animal story is quite interesting. We know that on a pound per pound or ton for ton basis, the most tonnage of antibiotics is, is used in animals as shown here. Over 60,000 tons of antimicrobials are given in animals around the world every year, either for therapy or for prevention of infection and growth promotion. The good news is that at least 40 countries now have policies to limit the use of antibiotics in livestock. Um, and as we've learned in doing this work and as in my privilege to uh, participate on the PACCARB, we have an equal representation of human doctors and animal doctors there. And we've learned a lot about the differences between species of animals and the difference between a food animal and companion animals. There are issues with antibiotic use in all of them, but it's important to learn about these differences as we try to understand the problem and then think about solutions. So here's a look at consumption of antibiotics in different species of animals. And I think the first message to take away here is if you look at the y-axis, you see that over 250,000 tons of antibiotics are given to all the variety of animals that are shown here. And you can see that the, the height of the pink stripe is that's uh, representing pigs is the highest. And so you can get a sense of the relative administration of antibiotics to different uh, animal types. And you'll also notice that the error bars around fish are very wide because it turns out the regulation of, of how fish are raised are quite different and we have the least amount of information on antimicrobials in, in fish. So animals can get us sick and everyone knows that from food related illness. And I highlight a study here of uh, 92 people in 29 states being infected with a strain of multidrug resi resistant salmonella from chicken. Uh, and there are many, many other examples of animals making humans sick uh, with antibiotic resistant pathogens and something we need to focus on. Well, what about our environment? This is an area that I would say we know the least about, uh, especially in the developed world. There are some very nice data from the developing world and I'm showing uh, this study from India looking at the Ganges River and what these investigators did is relatively um, straightforward. They looked at the water column in the Ganges River, and then they looked at the sediment at the bottom of the river downstream, and they measured 
uh, the, you know, the sort of presence of a variety of pathogens. And what they saw, if you look at the bottom chart compared to the top chart is there's a lot more of all of the pathogens and more resistant pathogens downstream in the river. And you know, it's important to know that in, in the Ganges River, it's drinking water, bathing water, and sewage water all together. So it makes sense that this would be the case with those mingling. And then the perhaps um, unexpected finding of this study is that they found a lot of very resistant pathogens, including uh, NDM1, beta-lactamase, which is a highly resistant pathogen. So, you know, it's all of these data led to the observations that antibiotic use, as well as public health conditions like having poor water around the globe, make a beautiful um, spreading ground for antibiotic resistance. And, you know, the developing countries have problems with water and availability to have sanitary conditions, and they often use antibiotics almost as a surrogate for that. Here in the developed countries, you know, we don't have those issues, but because we travel back and forth, the organisms travel back and forth. And we've seen that with things like NDM1 coming to the United States, for example. So another kind of concept to raise about the developing world is the issue of access. So while we in the United States are worried about overprescription and overuse, it is still true in 2021 that people in low and middle income countries lack access to antibiotics and healthcare in general. So they have unacceptably high neonatal mortality rates, all related to untreated infections. And so there, the issue is having access to antibiotics. And so all the measures that we talk about have to be taken in that context. And really a priority is not to limit access to antibiotics for those populations. So here's a look at a kind of infographic approach to the One Health uh, framework for combating antimicrobial resistance and taking into account a variety of different things. So surveillance, what's going on around the world, prevention efforts, access, which we mentioned, research, uh, developing new treatments, and then having people, a workforce, uh, to do this work, all very, very important if we're going to solve this problem. So let's start with awareness. Um, you know, at the beginning, I quoted Dame Sally, who's an incredible spokesperson for AMR, but it's still true that it, today we lack adequate awareness of this problem. And Mark Mendelson, who's a leader from South Africa, posted this tweet back in October during the COVID epidemic and said, COVID-19, a million deaths in 10 months, AMR predicted 10 million deaths by 2050. We have yet to overcome the hurdle of AMR without having a single reliable face to present this to the world. And I think he's sadly right and we still have work to do. The Wellcome Trust looked into this and did a really interesting study. If you're interested, the link is shown here where they went out and interviewed 12,000 people around the world about this problem. And they got some very interesting quotes. I won't um, belabor them, but the US one I think is pretty interesting. I think antibiotic resistance is an issue, but I think we have at least 10, 20 years before it becomes like a huge problem that affects a lot of people. The outcome of this work was really taking these five principles to help us gain awareness. So frame this as a problem that underlies modern medicine. Explain the fundamentals succinctly, which is what I'm trying to help with today. Emphasize that this is an issue that affects everyone. Focus on today, the here and now, and encourage immediate action. So these are the ways we hope to address it. Now let's turn to antibiotics. Uh, this is a look at the history of antibiotics and um, Dr. John Bartlett was one of our great leaders in this area and he's shown here. Um, we lost him sadly just a few months ago, but one of the messages here is that we went through a real drought in antibiotics with no new classes to treat gram negative uh, bacteria for four decades. And this is an area that Dr. Bonomo and his team have been very, uh, very highly engaged in. Another kind of concept about antibiotics is to remember that it takes a long time to make them. It takes 10 to 20 years at least. And this is a look at a number of our antibiotics, comparing them to things like HIV therapy at the bottom, right? We, we got AZT within six years and we had highly active antiretroviral therapy within 15 years in AIDS. And in COVID, we got a vaccine within a year. Antibiotics are very different. And we have to think about that as we think about ways to fix the problem. Here's a look at what happened with our antibiotic pipeline. It went from a heyday in the 80s down to almost nothing uh, in the early 2000s. And we've seen a little bit of a return and we'll talk more about that. At IDSA, at our Infectious Disease Society, 
we've been engaged in this problem for well over 15 years with trying to mobilize interest in the problem and then policy uh, driven solutions uh, to help save as many lives as possible. So on the world stage, antibiotic resistance came into the global play around 200, 2014. And in 2015, the WHO brought this problem forward and paved the way for a high level United Nations meeting in September of 2016 to make the world aware of the need to combat antibiotic resistance. And this was a really historic day. It was only the third time the UN had met on any infectious disease topic uh, and it was a very exciting day to be present for and part of uh, in a very good first step. Here locally in the United States, President Obama was very active through his Council uh, of Advisors for Science and Technology through this PCAS report that came out uh, and a national executive order to create a national action plan for combating antibiotic resistant bacteria. Out of that, the Presidential Advisory Committee was formed and the work has been ongoing since that time. What this plan called for was a number of targets to combat antibiotic resistance. And the first one was prescribing targets. So coming back to that problem of overprescription, they set hard targets in 2015 for a reduction in both inpatient and outpatient use of antibiotics. They wanted to decrease inappropriate uh, inpatient antibiotic use by 20% and outpatient by 50% in five years. We did not meet those targets, but I still think it's important that we had them. In 2019, the CDC updated their threat report. And there, this was a mixed bag of data. Good news was progress on infection prevention and hospital infections. So fewer deaths from antibiotic resistance in the hospital since 2013 and fewer deaths um, from the specific pathogen shown here. So you see like multidrug resistant pseudomonas down by 29%, drug resistant candida down by 25%. So that was reassuring news. Less reassuring is that there was more going on in the community, uh, an increase in antibiotic resistant infections due to things like resistant group A strep, Neisseria gonorrhea, and ESBL producing enterobacteriaceae. So this is really concerning and suggests that, you know, we're just scratching the surface of what's happening in the community. And this report led Samir Kadri and I to, to write this paper really digging into the data that the CDC uses. And you know, this data was used on modeling. A lot of it was um, modeling from VA data, which is good data. Um, but you know, we didn't know, we still don't know if all those risks are generalizable to a broader population and using attributable mortality uh, has its risks because that changes over time. Um, and you know, it's key that we get to a place where we can do better than estimate because using this is likely underestimating the impact of deaths uh, in this area. So the way to do that is to use the network that we have, the CDC NHSN, um, which is a module that allows us to report our antibiotic use into the CDC. They need funding for that to work uh, and we need better participation. Um, and uh, ideally we would include laboratory and other data so that we could get a sense of what's going on with resistant infections. So this is a need that is greatly uh, present today and something that I think is important for audiences like this to know, because I think sometimes we think more is happening than actually is. Another important uh, observation from the 2019 threat report was that of a new, of a new threat. Candida auris was not even listed in the 2013 threat report. And so by 2019, it was a big problem in our country and it still is. And so this makes the point that in order to prepare for a problem like antibiotic resistance, we have to prepare about the things we know about, MRSA and resistant gram-negative infections, and then the things we might not know about. We need to have a program that is broad enough that's gonna have some, some stuff going so that if we run into another threat that we didn't uh, fully expect, we can manage it and pivot in a way that we kind of did with COVID. So that underscores the need for a robust and renewable pipeline of tools, including drugs and vaccines. So speaking of drugs, um, the best source I think that's the most accessible to know what's happening in our pipeline is the Pew Development Pipeline. Uh, this is a look at it from 2019. At that time, there were 41 new antibiotics in development, 89% of them coming from small companies, not Big Pharma, not Pfizer, Merck and company. Um, only 15 in phase one, which is really not a good sign because that's a view of what we'll have in 10 years or 15 years. 
And only about 60% of those that make it to phase three will make it to FDA approval. So this is overall too small a number. And if we drill down, uh, there's not a huge amount of novelty here in terms of new classes and new mechanisms, which also makes us concerned about the long, the long-term benefits of the pipeline. So the pipeline was just updated a few months ago in March um, and very similar story, 43 antibiotics in development, 42% of them have potential activity against the gram negative so-called escape pathogens named by Dr. Lou Rice, also from case um, and concerning in terms of depth and number of antibiotics in this pipeline. So what needs to happen to fix it? Well, a number of things, and there has been some progress in the policy side through things like the GAIN Act that established certain pathways for antibiotics, an NIH uh, collaborative research group, which several of us here today are part of, was established in 2013 and has been quite successful. The CARBEX accelerator was uh, established and we'll talk about that. Um, and then we and others have done quite a bit of work in thinking about how to study antibiotics for some of these new needs, like a single pathogen indication just to treat resistant pseudomonas or just to treat resistant acinetobacter, for example. Not straightforward, but some progress has been made uh, and a lot of collaboration with our colleagues at NIH, FDA, and other governmental uh, agencies. Here's a look at that NIH collaborative group I mentioned. This is a little cartoon of the progress that was made in the first phase of that award. We're now in the second phase. Uh, I lead what's called the Innovation Task Force, and we're working on novel endpoints for FDA registration trials, as well as quality of life measures in antibiotic trials, looking at the patient's perception of how they're affected by infection and then how they're impacted by treatment, areas that really haven't been um, certainly optimized in infectious diseases like they have in uh, diseases like cancer, for example. So here's a look at where we are with the pipeline. And so we at IDSA had um, a goal of 10 new systemically available antibiotics by the year 2020. And the good news is, is that we got to 14 and you can see them here. Um, and we got to that by 2019. So we beat the 10 by 20 goal. Um, and you see, uh, if you look at these drugs, a number of them have the potential to treat resistant bacteria and, and some quite resistant. The bad news is, is that the financial situation went from bad to worse. And back in April of 2019, we saw bankruptcy of a company called Acaeogen that made one of those antibiotics. And this, this is a snapshot view of the stock prices of five companies making new antibiotics at that time. And you can see that of the five companies, all of their stock values were less than $10, four were less than $5, and several of them have gone bankrupt. So this is a little more recent view. Uh, showing that of the 15 new antibiotics approved in the last decade, five have had to go back on the shelf, either because of bankruptcy or because a company was sold to somebody who doesn't want to sell the antibiotics. So a lot of innovation and effort went into developing these antibiotics, but they're not available for our patients, which is a huge problem. And so we and others um, tried to ring the bell and get people interested in this problem and fixing the broken market. And you can see uh, the prestigious medical journals like um, the Hill in Newsweek, where we brought this message. Um, and this is really an interesting sort of part of the advocacy uh, work is, is learning how to communicate in different uh, venues than just scientific journals. The WHO has also raised concern about the pipeline. And this is very unusual for the WHO to run into a product area, but they have published several warnings, including this one from January of uh, concern about the drowning, drowning global antibiotic pipeline and what that means to global public health. The reasons for this are quite complicated and our friends at Pew put out these very nice infographics recently that talk about the reasons for the market failure with antibiotics. And you know, it's a combination of factors. The fact that it takes so long to develop antibiotics and so much money on the order of a billion dollars uh, to get them to FDA approval and then antibiotics, especially injectable antibiotics, have very high manufacturing costs. And the so-called running costs, the costs of making the antibiotic, keeping up with the post-approval commitments, the pediatric studies that are required, and then all the things that need to be done for safety monitoring and manufacturing runs on the order of 350 to $400 million in the first 10 years. And so what happened was these new antibiotics weren't sold enough 
to even cover those running costs. And that's how these companies ran into bankruptcy. And so fixing this, this period after FDA approval has become the focus of a lot of attention. So the kind of attention is in things called incentives. And the idea of incentives is to find a predictable, robust way to motivate both industry and private investors to want to make these antibiotics and to target the areas of greatest medical need. And then from us in infectious disease to align those with the principles of good stewardship, right? Not to overuse these precious resources, but to maintain access for those who need them. And the incentives come in two buckets, so-called push incentives that happen before FDA approval and pull incentives that happen after FDA approval. And we'll talk a little about each. So the idea is we need a suite of them. We need a little bit of each so that we end up with a sustainable pipeline. And this is just, again, a little bit more um, from that uh, Pew study that may help visualize this a bit. So on the push side, I think the most important um, thing for me to share with you is CARBEX. And this is a public-private partnership that was set up between uh, BARDA and the Department of Defense and a number of partners, including the Wellcome Trust uh, and a number of academic partners that is now five years in to focus on early development. So from the discovery until the time something would get into people, they have 48 active projects, 36 of them are therapeutics, 18 new drug classes. So a lot of novelty, a lot of exciting science. They're also looking at diagnostic tests and preventatives like vaccines, microbiome altering agents, things that are a little beyond the topic of the conversation today, but very important as we think about combating a complicated problem. And then a number of non-traditional therapies, so non-small molecule um, targets. So a lot of really exciting science here. On the kind of in the middle push side is the AMR Action Fund that was just announced last summer. This is a $1 billion fund that was put together by a number of big pharma companies. So the Pfizer Mercs of the world who got out of antibiotic development largely came together with, again, the Wellcome Trust, uh, the European Investment Bank, and some other partners to say, we're going to pool our resources and try to bring two to four new antibiotics to market in the next 10 years. So this is another step forward, we hope. On the legislative side here in the United States, to address that pull, that after FDA approval, uh, two things for me to share with you. One is called the Pasteur Act, which was introduced last September and is about to be reintroduced. It's a bipartisan, bicameral uh, piece of legislation that basically presents a subscription model, a so-called Netflix model for antibiotics, where federal payments for a new antibiotic are guaranteed at the time of FDA approval for up to 10 years following approval. These payments are completely decoupled or de-risked, de-linked from sales of the antibiotic so that there's a predictable return of investment, but no incentive to overuse. They're linked to good stewardship and antibiotic use reporting, in fact, to the CDC via that NHSN that I measured, that I mentioned. A lot of details have gone into this, and I'm happy to talk about them in the Q&A, but this is a very kind of well-baked plan. It's supported by the IDSA and over 130 other um, interest groups and parties, academic and otherwise. And this is the most likely legislation, I think, that we could see passed. The UK has a subscription model that's already proceeding, as does Sweden, so we're going to learn from them about whether such a model can work. Another pull method that has been introduced but hasn't passed is the so-called DISARM Act, which is a uh, looking at the way antibiotics are reimbursed. So the idea would be to remove certain antibiotics from the um, Medicare bundle so that they could be reimbursed separately. So antibiotic for a very serious resistant infection uh, could be reimbursed separately. And so there wouldn't be that disincentive to use it uh, in the hospital. This is attractive to some, not attractive to others, and is a little bit on the back burner right now, but still being talked about in Washington. Finally, there's a nonprofit approach, right? So we think about tuberculosis, um, other diseases, there's been great progress on the nonprofit or, and, and or partnership side. And so Nielsen colleagues had this piece in the New England Journal a couple of years ago, advocating for a nonprofit approach. Another sort of hybrid approach is the Guard P, which is another kind of public-private partnership globally looking at more neglected diseases. And I think what we may need is a combination of all of these if we're gonna to get to some kind of progress in this space. So a note about stewardship, I'm sure it's no, I know you have an active stewardship program at, at Case, but just to remind everybody that stewardship is not just a cost-cutting measure, right? It's using the optimal antibiotic dose and duration 
with minimal unintended consequences to the patient, right? It is to improve patient outcomes. It also brings along the savings and other things, but very important that our ultimate goal with stewardship is to improve patient care and healthcare outcomes. We've had stewardship here at Tufts for over 15 years and great you know, uh, experience in terms of safety and quality and uh, saving money. Uh, and now we have two full-time ID physicians and one full-time PharmD running our program. There's lots of data showing that stewardship has an impact on antibiotic resistance. I'm just showing one study here, but good stewardship leads to decreased resistance for sure. We're now at a state where Medicare has uh, stipulated that all hospitals and long-term care facilities have stewardship as a condition of participation. Our industry colleagues are fully on board with stewardship, which wasn't true uh, not that long ago. Uh, we're embracing it in a One Health approach. And I think we're grappling with some of the unintended consequences of stewardship. You know, the focus on cost containment in some venues has become a challenge. And some people have felt that stewardship limits access. And of course, that is not the intention and something that needs, you know, our continued, our, our continued attention as we develop these programs. On the how we use new antibiotics front, very excited to share uh, that IDSA published their first antibiotic resistance guidance last September. And Dr. Bonomo is a member of the founding team uh, leading these real life online active guidances. So the idea is that as the data changes about resistance and available treatments, these guidances will be updated so that clinicians will know how to use the tools that they have optimally. And this was a huge step forward. There had been a lot of criticism of our guidelines taking too long and really being not that useful clinically. A little bit on equity. It turns out that antibiotic resistance has a lot of issues with equity. And this is a, a diagram from a paper published by colleagues in CMAR uh, in our institute here at Tufts, looking at some of the equity issues around antibiotic resistance. And what I would say is there are local and global issues, and there's a really fruitful, I think, avenue for research as we go forward for any of the young people who might be interested in this area. In terms of the future, the 2020 National Action Plan was released uh, not that long ago and has some very important updates that are good. It has increasing targets, uh, many more hard targets than we had in 2015. It has a focus on young investigators that I've highlighted, a call for over 60 new investigator awards by 2021 this year, um, and a lot of other positive things. On the um, development front, it calls for a number of new drugs uh, and a number of new diagnostic tests. That's all good. What's not good is the funding and uh, we haven't seen how the funding is gonna work yet. And so that is uh, what gets me to my next, or almost next call. So I hope I've convinced you that the crisis of antibiotic resistance has arrived, that it's a risk to all of us, that we need to approach it with a One Health lens. And then my, my really plea for you is to think about being part of the change here. Be a voice for your patients. Tell stories about how antibiotics affects them and, and your work. That is what we need. And there are a number of people you know, really doubling down on this now. There's gonna be a couple of, there's gonna be an HBO movie and some other things to try to raise awareness. But I think we as physicians have a job to do here and advocate for new drugs and stewardship at your hospital and for more rapid uptake of new drugs and, and guidances on how to use them. And then really think about being an advocate. When you get that request to call or email your Senator or Congressperson, think about doing it because I think we need a movement and that is how we're gonna be part of the change and part of the solution. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you to Dr. Naff, to Dr. Bonomo and to all of you uh, for your kind welcome and for having me. And here's my Twitter, if anyone wants to tweet and I will stop sharing and say thanks again. Virtual Zoom. <laughs> thanks for that fantastic talk. Um, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, it took a crisis for the government to say, here's a billion dollars, make a vaccine. And um, it seems like the, the economic model of antibiotics just doesn't work anymore. Um, I mean, do we, do we need a new, and I know this is something you all talked about, but do we need a new economic model to ensure a pipeline of vaccines to deal with this crisis? We, we do, and 
as recently as the last uh, maybe three weeks, I've been at two different sort of high level discussions trying to get people to say yes, right? <laughs> to say yes to investing in this space. And it is tough because the, there are a lot of people who care about this problem and people who have been in the antibiotic business before who know, know the need, know that we need to fix it. But there's still this feeling that until we get to a place where there is some, not guaranteed, but reliable return on that investment, mm -hmm. that they're going to have a hard time getting venture capitalists. You know, whether you're talking about little guys and venture capital, or you're talking about big pharma investing here instead of in obesity or cancer. Um, that is the that is the challenge. I mean, I think the good news is that there's a rising sentiment that at the, in the heels of this epidemic, this is the time. This is the time to think about preparedness. This is the time to say if we don't do it now, when? Um, and, and to your other point, um, Dr. Armitage, I think we didn't really talk about it, but drugs are really difficult. Vaccines are impossible. And this is an area where vaccines could matter, but the economic argument there is even worse. So it is, it is a wicked problem. And I'm very hopeful. And you know, I know Robert and many of us are still doing everything we can to convince people to jump on board while there's time. And you, you mentioned the, the paradox of stewardship because effective stewardship deals both with appropriate use, overuse and cost. So effective stewardship cuts on the profit margins by having appropriate use of the most, you know, antibiotics against resistant organisms. So um, um, <clears throat> Dr. Sidigan put a question in the chat. Um, the question is, as more and more uh, world economics emerges out of poverty and, ex and excess healthcare, other governments don't have systems in place for stewardship. How do you think it will affect resistance? So I guess as, as developing nations can afford more antibiotics, but there's less stewardship, do you think, I guess, could potentially the global, global situation get worse? Yeah, no, I think that's the, that's the expectation is the global situation will get worse. And one of the key drivers is going to be protein in people's diets. So if you look at the, um, it's really staggering. If you look at the uh, projections for beef and uh, chicken and pork in other parts of the world, it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And that the resistance problem that that's going to generate among other problems is, mm -hmm. is absolutely huge. And there was a great 60 minutes <clears throat> early this year that showed some of those aspects in a way that was memorable. <laughs> Not pretty, but memorable. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems so much so crazy that so much resistance comes out of um, poultry, and uh, I, I, I guess people ask me, what does giving Cipro to a bunch of chickens do for the chickens? I guess it increases egg production. I don't recall how, but well, it increases um, it increases their weight, yeah. so that's how they get paid more. And Stuart Levy. Um, who was kind of a pioneer here at Tufts and who our center is named after, he did one of the first studies in the 70s looking at feeding antibiotics to chickens in a chicken coop out of Western Mass. And he was, you know, really not well received when he published that data. <laughs> it was really true. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, Dr. Naff, but that was very, very controversial in the day. Yeah. <laughs> George, I don't know if... Uh... I cut you off. We like having you on camera. We can see the pictures of your grandkids on your refrigerator. But uh, <laughs> um, did, you, did you have any comments or questions, George? Uh, no, it was, I really enjoyed this. And uh, it was so great for you to be here and to bring us up to, uh, well, with Bob here. And uh, we hear a lot about it, but uh, uh, it was um it's certainly a major problem, and it's one that we uh, need to focus on. And um, it seems to me that the the real problem is getting the resources to do it. Yeah. That's the problem, sure. and uh, it's going to uh, end up being a political problem. I think uh, somehow we have to get to the people who have the uh, likelihood of making this available in order to do it because the pharmaceutical industry is not going to do it. Yeah, interesting. Uh, we, we have this uh, incredible tradition at our VA, Dave Schles, Lou Rice, Bob Bonomo and his group. Um, Robert, 
I said, I said, Robert, I do that all the time. Um, any comments or questions, Robert? No, I was, uh, there's some very interesting questions in the, in the chat. Uh, one on community-based uh, uh, stewardship programs. Um, and the other one is about social sciences being involved in a One Health approach. Maybe, Helen, you want to give your perspective on those two problems? Sure. So community-based stewardship is a huge opportunity. And uh, we have a group who's very involved in stewardship and long-term care facilities. I didn't get into that here, but you know, real disasters happen in long-term care facilities with antibiotics. And whether they're for ventilated patients or not ventilated patients, we see incredible things. So uh, we're doing some studies and some work with the Department of Public Health uh, for stewardship in that setting. But then there's the whole outpatient arena. And I hope that as we see more systemization of healthcare, there'll be more opportunities to kind of interact with practices, urgent cares, you know, other settings, dermatology offices, you know, places where lots of antibiotics are prescribed to make some impact. But that, I think that's a huge opportunity. And hopefully we'll see some funding. Again, if you look at the National Action Plan, I didn't belabor this, but it calls for a lot of really exciting things. The question is really when and where is the funding going to come from? Um, and then to your point, Robert, about the um, social sciences, incredibly important. So implementation science is a huge area um, that needs to continue to grow here, right? How we know it's not good, right? We know it's not good to give everybody broad spectrum antibiotics when they get admitted to the hospital. <laughs> How do we get people to change their behavior, right? And that's the whole implementation science piece. How do we get people to stop culturing the urine off the Foley catheter? You know, you name it, all the different things we focus on. Um, and that is, is a really growing space. It's interesting, and I'd love to hear um, any of your all's thoughts about this. You do encounter some pushback in the kind of traditional academic settings. You know, the people who do um, health systems research and do qualitative research, the way they operate is very different than the way a statistician in a clinical trial group operates. And, you know, I would say in our ARLG, we've had some very interesting discussions and it's not always so easy. You know, it's not always so easy to navigate that and, you know, for the qualitative scientists to feel embraced and at an equal footing academically. So I think that's an area that we could really, um, we could improve. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I think one of the biggest problems we have is, you know, it, the area is very complex and, you know, we always uh, focus upon, you know, KPCs and NDMs, you know, these carbon penem resistant organism impossible to treat. And, but the number of people, although increasing is still small, the biggest problem we have in the country really is the SBLs. And, um, you know, when you look at the United States Jernigan's paper in the New England Journal, when it came out in 2020, it was old data. When it came out from, you know, 2012 to 2017, there was a 35% increase in ESBLs. And the community was believed to be the source you know, of that. And like, you know, we have good hospital programs, but addressing the, you know, the community programs are also critical. And it's very hard to have, you know, these conflicted, you know, programs in place where in one place, you know, you're trying to develop a drug against an MBL, and then you're trying to do antimicrobial stewardship. And then you're trying to keep people out of the hospital by giving them broad spectrum antibiotics as an outpatient. You know, it's, you know, it, it, maybe you're right. We need social scientists to tell us how to think, you know, because we need improvement. Yeah, no, we do. And, you know, we're going to have an oral, we, we may well have an oral carbapenem soon. How are we going to manage that? Right? That's going to be a whole nother thing to manage. Yeah. The society has to make a decision, you know. Uh, or, you, know is, you know, is it Pandora's box or is this a panacea? Mm -hmm. You know, does this keep people out of the hospital and save five days of hospitalization or gets them out sooner? Or are we going to start driving carbapenem resistance in the, in the community? And, you know, I think the ARLG will see the first results of that in their clinical trial. Mm -hmm. they, have a, they have a clinical trial looking at TEBI, you know, for ESBL step-down therapy. And, you know, we'll have to see how that data goes. We all want an open mind and we all want it to work. But you know, it's 
we have to see how these things shake out. Robert, uh, can you tell the group what ESBL is? Not yeah, all. I'm ESBL sorry. Extended extended spectrum beta lactamases. They mm -hmm. uh, they usually arrive in uh, uh, bacteria like E. coli and Klebsiella, and they're you know common plasmid or chromosomal genes that make a single point mutation, and then make uh, uh, antibiotics like ceftazidine not work. They make uh, cephalosporins very tricky to use. And, you know, those are the common drugs that we use as in the nursing home, you know, we've used ceftriaxone for years. You know, in the hospital, we use ceftriaxone for years. And when you lose ceftriaxone, you lose a very important drug in your, uh, you know, uh, antibiotic armamentarium. Sure. And these are a lot of patients, you know, some healthy young women with urinary tract infections who come in failing several courses of antibiotics and the test comes back and says there is no pill. You know, a lot of them have an ESBL uh, producing organism and it's a huge problem, you know, across the country having to put pick lines in these people and um, there's a lot of morbidity there. Yeah, thanks. I think the, the hour's coming to a close. I just like to say I'm, my 30 plus years here, Dr. Naff has been an inspiration as a scientist, a clinician and a teacher and that um, Helen, your, your talk more than did justice to, to Dr. Neff. So thank you very much for a fantastic talk. And Dr. Bonomo is going to kind of continue this next week with, with some more specifics on this whole area. So we're looking forward to that too. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. What an honor. <laughs>